is going to give a talk entitled uh, <laughs> Why I Like Brave, a memoir of mothering and movies. Thank you, Emerald. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, before I start my presentation, um, I wanted to use this public forum to make an announcement um, of something, some other things that I'm very excited about. One thing is my class um, is not meeting today because I teach it at this time, so this announcement couldn't be made in my class, and that is that um, Podar Latino is doing a presentation tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. called Raices. It's a cultural presentation. Did I pronounce it well? Okay, I've been practicing. Um, and um, and I, urge, I urge you to go to that. Um, my second announcement uh, is attached to this beautiful image. Um, this is the cover of the romance novel that my honors students um, wrote last semester. Last semester in a 15-week class, um, Jessica Antrobus, Megan Coyle, Miranda Gill, and Erica Smythe wrote um, a romance novel after discovering for themselves um, by reading them and talking about them and laughing so hard we fell out of our chairs about them and then taking them seriously. Um, we learned some difficult things like where the arms go in a kissing scene. Turns out that's hard to do. Um, <coughs> It's true. Um, last weekend, um, we uploaded our romance, Recipe for Love, There Is Cooking in It. Um, we uploaded it to Kindle. You may purchase this romance for your Kindles for 99 cents, and I'm telling you, it's a bargain. Um, I'll give you... Here is the description. Take one independent-minded, slightly clumsy chef. Separate her from her former lover, but let her keep the dog. Take a second son who is trying to make it in business on his own. Mix them at a business launch where she's made the hors d'oeuvres, but spills them down his front. Let their eyes meet. Bake the whole mess at a steady temperature. Wait for the oven to explode. It's a perfect love souffle, yes, with kissing scenes. Yes, it's very good. Um, Megan Coyle designed the beautiful cover, um, and I'm really, really proud of them. The characters are interesting, it's character driven, it's sprightly, and true love wins in the end, which I know is a relief to all of you. Um, Two of my writers, Megan Coyle and Erica Smythe, are right there, and it's a significant accomplishment, so I just wanted to let you know. So go to your Kindles. If you put in any one of their names or my name along with this title, you can find the book. <clears throat> Okay, now for my, um, <clears throat> my talk today, Why I Like Brave, a memoir of mothering and the movies. If there are any Lola students in the audience, this is a multi-genre presentation, um, <clears throat> a hybrid. So it has some memoir, it has some storytelling, and it has some cultural criticism and some analysis. There's a mix of those things, so pay attention. <clears throat> <clears throat> right. Why I Like Brave, a memoir of mothering and the movies. Before we left the hospital after the birth of our daughter, my husband and I had broken nearly every rule we had made for ourselves as prospective parents. We had allowed the baby to interrupt a meal. We had held her on our laps during said meal. We had had an unironic conversation about bowel movements. <laughs> we had overshared concerning her brilliance and beauty, despite the fact that she was shaped like a squashed bag of cat food and she had yet to utter an intelligible word. 
But we hadn't yet broken the rule I was most concerned about, not yet. We had not yet plunked her in front of a Disney movie. She was too young, too impressionable. As a feminist of the second wave, I knew the dangers. All those princesses singing about someday their prince coming while they performed unpaid housework for a group of guys, or mooned around with woodland creatures hoping to go to a ball while doing, you guessed it, housework. These were the role models I wanted for my future president of the world. Where were their mothers? Why weren't they setting a better example for their little princesses? As an expectant mother who was also an English instructor teaching four writing courses a semester, I was counting on common sense as the default mode for most parenting challenges. Unlike my other overeducated pregnant 30-something friends, I was not downing protein shakes to make extra baby brain cells. I could barely keep breakfast down. I was not taking infant CPR. And I wasn't reading everything I could find about how to meet and beat the challenges of parenthood at the turn of the millennium. I was grading essays. I didn't have time. I read What to Expect When You're Expecting for its reassuring homey cover of a woman in a wooden rocker. with a quilt laid against the back, suggesting that all the changes to my body and the challenges ahead were entirely natural. The only other book I read was Sherry Benstock's beautiful book of fetal photography. My husband and I would open it to the page corresponding to the month of my pregnancy. We'd look at the grainy black and white photograph of a shape that looked a lot like a sea monkey granule after you've submerged it in water and say, that's what she looks like now. The first two movies we saw with our daughter confirmed, for me, my common sense approach to parenting and our daughter's intellectual brilliance. They horrified everyone else. The summer she was born, we saw License to Kill, the last Tim Timothy Dalton James Bond movie. I love James Bond movies, all of them. Here is our thinking. It was hot. Our baby did not like heat. Movie theaters in Virginia were delightfully air-conditioned. They were dark. James Bond movies are loud. No one would hear her if she cried, and I could hold her in a sling and nurse her if she grew restless. Check, check, check. I was right on all counts. And, like feeding your child the food you like to eat, say, pureed pasta and pesto, they grow up liking a lot of what you like. So now we have James Bond movies in common. The second movie was the 1958 Steve McQueen version of The Blob. <laughs> we had put her to bed an hour before when we heard the little feet coming down the hall and down the stairs. We let her sit on the couch between us with a cup of water. Every time the blob began pouring out of the subway or a sewer, moving towards the unsuspecting extras, she would lean back against the pillow, sighing happily, and say, Uh-oh! We were thrilled. She understood suspense. She got the plot. She anticipated what would happen next. She would definitely be president of the world or a movie critic. Of course, it couldn't last. Despite our best intentions, we remembered Disney movies from our own childhoods. They were a treat, like sugared cereal. OK, we said we would try the animal movies, Bambi, that was a classic. Surely that would be a good movie without gender bias. <laughs> Approximately a year later, I would be in the kitchen making supper, our daughter in the adjacent room watching Bambi. I listened abstractedly, smiling at fragments of dialogue that came through over running water and the noises of chopped vegetables. There was Thumper. There was Bambi's shy voice saying something wispy to flower. And then there was my daughter calling out in a crescendo of announcements. Uh-oh, here it comes, Mom. The part you hate. You hate this part. Cover your ears. Blam. Then Bambi's voice. Mother? Mother, where are you? Mother? Your mother can't be with you anymore. 
He just said, your mother can't be with you anymore. Sorry. I guess it's a good thing that from a very early age, children learn their parents' ideologies along with their idiosyncrasies. I had told her I hated that Bambi's mother is killed, even though we knew deer were killed every day, if not in hunting season, then on the highway, because we saw them lying on their sides along the road as we drove to kindergarten every morning. Those deer, the roadside deer, the hunter's deer, were part of everyday life. It was sad to see them, but it wasn't enraging. Bambi's mother's death was part of a plot, and that was different. Here's what I mean by plot. Bambi's mother, she doesn't have a name, she has a function, dies before the story gets underway. Her death in the movie and in the novel on which the movie is based is the cause of her son's melancholy, which he must learn to overcome. Her usefulness to the story is in creating a pastoral birth narrative in which we see Bambi and his friends in a gentle, female-inflected, natural world and in dying in order to create the situation in which Bambi must learn to navigate his world on his own with a little help from a previously absent dad. In other words, she is more useful to the plot of the story, dead than alive. I had a problem with that. <laughs> the story of Bambi is based upon a novel in which Bambi's mother also dies, so this is not part of a Disney conspiracy. It's also true that dead parents are often the rule in fairy tales and coming-of-age stories where the young protagonist must seek his or her fortune in a cruel world without the protection of parents or family. We don't need to look any further than the Harry Potter series to see that trope reinforced to brilliant effect. Now, what my watching of Bambi for the sixth time as an adult who was also a mother solidified for me was the general absence of mothers from the movies our children were watching and re-watching. Fathers are also absent, but they are more likely to be absent-minded than literally gone from the plot. When you do have a mother in this story, she's often an animal character. 101 Dalmatians, Lady and the Tramp, Dumbo. These mothers' identities as characters in a story revolve around their children, and they can be fierce if they perceive the need to protect their children from harm. If they are powerful or too fierce, they are punished as part of the plot. Like Dum Dumbo's mother, she goes to jail when she tries to protect Dumbo. In the Disney cartoons with human characters, we rarely have mothers. As with so many fairy tales and romances, the young girl's mother has died giving birth to her or a sibling, and the girl must learn to make her way forward in an androcentric or male-centered world in which other women are depicted as either desexualized helpers who are little better than personal shoppers, like the fairy godmothers in Cinderella, or, if they are powerful, they are presented as highly sexualized, angry, older women who are competing with the young protagonist for a position in society, because there's only room for one. Ursula in The Little Mermaid, um, Maleficent, Sleeping Beauty. Even as the movies began to shift with the culture through the 80s and 90s, after the arguments of second-wave feminism that women should have a place in the world larger than the tropes of marriage and family, the story of a young girl's finding her way in the world still embraces the romantic trope and not much else. The more powerful sexualized female characters are distinguished from and vanquished by an idealized version of mother with a capital M who, while absent slash dead, is recognized as an abiding image of a desire for maternal love. For a girl growing up on Disney, the messages about herself imagined through the characters of Disney princesses is troubling. To succeed in the enduring plots of these movies, the heroine must subsume her anger at injustice. She must relinquish power to have family. And though the implication may be that she will have children, she is not sexual. Sexual or powerful or angry female figures are depicted as bad. During the same era as the Bambi scene enacted in our home, I was again in the kitchen, this time on a weekend, making something we would consume later in the week, 
and I hope these images of my domesticity are not lost on my audience. My daughter perambulated through the kitchen, gesturing and saying things under her breath. She came in one doorway, left through another doorway, only to complete the circle through the living room and come back through the first doorway, still gesturing and muttering. What are you doing? I asked. I'm playing Snow White, she said. Really? I said, chopping more vegetables. Yes, she said. Don't you think Snow White is sort of stupid? I said. She stopped what she was doing and looked at me consideringly. What do you mean? She asked. Well, I said, putting down the knife and bending down to look her in the eyes. Snow White knows the queen wants to kill her, and she's the only other woman in the story. So why, when an old woman comes to the door with presents for her that make her drop good as dead, isn't she more suspicious? Especially the second time. <laughs> the dwarves even tell her not to trust anyone, don't they? Yes, she said. They do. Okay, I said, straightening up. That's why I think she's stupid. My daughter stood and thought about Snow White or whatever it was she was thinking about for a few moments and then wandered out of the kitchen. Half an hour later, she came back through, this time marching to some purpose while again muttering under her breath and scowling fiercely. Who knows what I was doing? Making soup? Mixing up biscuits? What are you playing now? I asked. Snow White, she said. <laughs> really? Yep, she said and continued through. On the next pass, she said, only this time, I'm the smart Snow White. <laughs> How does that work, I asked. This Snow White takes the evil queen up the mountain and pushes her off herself, she said. <laughs> then exited, scowling. Did I feel better? Yes, I did. <laughs> Our daughter was born on the cusp of some of Disney's most brilliant animated movies. <clears throat> we watched them all. My sister, who was worried we wouldn't give her popular culture or sugared cereal, gave her niece an aerial sleeping bag for her second birthday. The Little Mermaid came out the year she was born, followed by Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, The Lion King, Pocahontas. Well, you get the picture. While these Disney princesses were more assertive, smarter, and naughtier than the earlier princesses like Snow White or Aurora from Sleeping Beauty, which came out the year I was born, they hadn't changed all that much in terms of the plot in which they found themselves. Girl of marriageable age, or just girl feeling her hormones kicking in, looks around the world she lives in, sees that it limits her, wants more, and finds a boy who will give it to her. The implication at the end of each Disney romance is that they will marry and have beautiful children with big Bambi eyes that will look just like the beautiful children they still are. That means that Belle and Ariel, Jasmine, Pocahontas, Snow White et al. would turn into mothers. Or maybe not. <laughs> this is the day... This is the day your dreams come true. What do you know about my dreams, Gaston? Plenty. Here, picture this. A rustic hunting lodge, my latest kill roasting on the fire, and my little wife massaging my feet. While well, the little ones play on the floor with the dogs. Oh, we'll have six or seven. Dogs? No, Belle. Strapping boys like me. <clears throat> Yeah. He says children, she says dogs. Possibly Belle, <clears throat> who is, after all, a great reader of romances, has figured out that once she becomes a mother, she falls right out of the story, out of the plot, and out of history. Certainly, with the Disney romances based upon fairy tales, which originally have come out of much earlier periods in history, when childbirth often did mean the death of the mother, this makes some sense. 
though Disney has manipulated other aspects of plot and character to correspond more closely to the present day of viewers. Why not mothers? Which brings me to Brave, finally. <coughs> Briefly, the story of Brave is set in the Scottish Highlands sometime long ago and far away when men wore kilts. The story opens idyllically at the edge of a forest with toddler Merida playing under her parents' watch. She is threatened by an enormous bear, rescued by her mother who runs with her and her father who fights the bear and loses a leg but survives. The story then jumps ahead in time to Merida's adolescence and a classic mother-daughter conflict. Merida doesn't want to follow in her mother's footsteps, marry a laird of a neighboring clan, and carry on cultural traditions by first of all learning them, and then having children and teaching them. In other words, she doesn't want to be her mother. The wonderful thing, though, is that she still has a mother, right there in the story, with whom she argues every day about not wanting to do her embroidery, learn her lessons, or be a wife. We can apply the Disney princess hair test to gauge the strength of her resistance to the status quo. Perfectly coiffed equals compliance, which gives way to the extent that there are loose tendrils. That's the year I was born. It explains a lot. <coughs> That's Aurora from Sleeping Beauty. Here's Belle, that wonderful escaping tendril. There's Merida in a wimple, but still, there's the tendril. Merida unbound. <laughs> yeah, go Merida. Merida rejects her suitors assembled by her parents for a classic male sporting competition in which the winner wins her by insisting on competing for her own hand and hitting the bullseye on all the targets. She evades her mother's anger by fleeing into the woods, meeting a witch, and asking for a spell to get her mother off her back. This is the real conflict and drama of the story. One glance at the suitors and their fathers, whom they would presumably grow to resemble, would suggest we don't need to take the romantic trope seriously, even though it has been invoked. The witch, another woman who wants to break out of her prescribed role, she's a wood carver and would rather be an artist than a witch, makes Merida a cake and tells her to feed it to her mother. It will take care of the problem. Back home, Merida serves it on a tray with a flower in a show of feminine contrition that her mother gratefully accepts. Finally, Merida is acting like a proper girl. But the spell like all deals with witches and demigods in archetypal stories, backfires, and Merida's mother is transformed into a bear. There is the usual visual vamping. At first, she's shocked. Oh, she's naked except for her pearls. She doesn't fit through doorways. She has a fat bear butt. Merida's brothers, the triplets, eat the leftover cake and turn into little bears that look just about as cute and furry as they did when they were human. The story then follows Merida's horror at what she has done, her desire to return things to normal, the need to protect the bear that is her mother from her father, who understandably has a thing about bears, and a frantic race against time to restore her mother to her human shape before anyone is irreparably hurt. The story ends, of course, in Merida figuring out how to reverse the spell and unify her family and the suitors are, for now, sent amicably packing. The end. My daughter and I saw the movie together and loved it. We cried. 
Finally, we said, a mother-daughter story with adventure and magic and bears and witches and the need to accept and deal with one's bearish, witchy behavior. Did we feel better? Yes, we did. One of the trailers for the movie would have us believe that the bravest part of Brave is Meredith standing up for herself against the status quo. It depicts her squinting down the line of her arrow from behind her bow as she takes aim at something we can't see. The target? The marriage trope? The idea that traditions and culture must be preserved by curtailing women's freedom and access to the world? by locking girls always more firmly into their smaller domestic world on the premise that they are the sacred keepers of the cultural flame and must keep it burning close to home? This is the same 19th century ideal of women as the sacred carriers of a higher morality that had to be protected by keeping them safe and justify keeping them tied to the domestic sphere. It's just dressed in another plot. Indeed, wild, unruly-haired Merida is taking aim at those things and it is brave. The movie gives us a nice glimpse, too, of a genuine marriage between the one-legged father and his fierce queen. We see them bantering and laughing with each other, and even laughing at their children, which rescues the children from being idealized little darlings like Bambi. Sorry. <clears throat> but the bravest part of brave is the mother's story. Let's go back. The mother in this story, she has a name. Eleanor begins by reinforcing the status quo. Merida must take her female place in the order of things, subsume her desire for adventure and her interest in archery. Princesses do not put their weapons on the table, says the queen. <coughs> her <laughs> Just as we might imagine, um, she, she does not want to uh, she, uh, Merida will have to subject her child, fierce and ruly self, to marriage, just as we might imagine the mother did. One interesting thing this movie does is make it clear to the viewer that Merida really is too young to consider marriage. While she doesn't want to learn her mother's cultural lessons, her romantic daydreams are steeped in the landscape and therefore in the culture, steeped in following the wisp that lures her to the wit, certainly, but also the deeper magic that abjures her to follow her own heart. We have already seen in the opening idyllic family bear scene that Eleanor, the mother, is capable of action. The family is free and joyful in the natural landscape, enjoying a picnic and each other. They do not seem bound by onerous duties and the mother is not bound by encircling walls or contained within a house. When the bear comes, she easily scoops up her toddler, leaps onto a horse, and makes a successful run for it. She is physical, resourceful, and strong. When we next see her, she is literally bound by the thick stone walls of the castle keep. She instructs her daughter on embroidery and culture. She tells Merida she will have to grow up, which equals marriage. The queen is completely defined by her domestic role and appears to have the sole responsibility for ruling the kingdom. In a second major domestic scene, this time in the castle at dinner time, we see the father eating heartily and telling the story of losing his leg while he presumably throws leg bones from what he is eating to the dogs on the floor. Merida sneaks in late, gives her little brother's cakes, finishes her father's story, and rushes out as the mother sits at the table, not eating, frowning and frustrated, and unable to keep control of husband, dogs, daughter, triplets. There's an interesting portrait at work here. On the one hand, her fecundity, her sexual nature, is embodied in the four children. She has survived childbirth. She is powerful and present. She has a voice, and she uses it, generally for instruction. Though she is cast as the parent whom Merida will have to defy, she is not a witch and not evil. We know where the triplets came from, so she is not a disembodied, desexualized image of maternal love. Indeed. She doesn't look very loving in a lot of the scenes. She looks angry. I keep thinking about her slimness and the fact that we don't see her eat or drink, even though the movie is full of scenes of eating and drinking. Is there a kind of self-abnegation or self-starving going on here? I don't mean to suggest an eating disorder. What I wonder is whether there's a metaphor at work here, whether the role she has taken on as real mother is starving her in some way. When she first becomes the bear, Eleanor is a comic figure. 
No longer the slim, elegant queen, she is naked, hairy, and confused. This is the kind of buffoonery that Disney does so well, and it's brilliant in the movie, but also startling in that she, unlike the holy comic characters of other stories, is so clearly distraught, and her bearish figure in the now ridiculous pearls and crown is so much at odds with her regal, fierce, ruling personality, the one her daughter is rebelling against. We have seen her as a queen stalking the parameters of the great hall, trying to keep order. In fact, the only keeper of order, while the men boast of their prowess and drink. She is both necessary to the plot and outside or on the edges of the action. Now as a bearer, we see her repeat the same walk around the parameters of the hall as she attempts to escape its confines where, as a bear, she will be killed by her husband. In the woods, a guilty Merida tries to free her mother feed her mother breakfast after a cold night spent in the elements outside the protection or the confines of the castle. First, Eleanor tries to feed them, but picks poisonous berries because her knowledge isn't Wood's knowledge, and Merida knocks them away. Eleanor, still at this point a queen inside a bear suit, looks askance. Then Merida creates a serving plate of leaves to suggest that she and her bear mother are still civilized. Gradually, we see Merida's guilt transform to regret and empathy as she matures in this new relationship with her mother, who is bearish but vulnerable. Ironically, Merida begins to see her mother in the bear form as a person. But as Merida transforms into a more adult, more empathetic version of herself, her mother also begins to transform, becoming gradually more bear than queen. We see her reverting to all fours as they move through the forest. We see her move away from Merida, snuffling at things that would interest a bear. In the beginning of the transformation, we knew instinctively that to become a bear made sense. Eleanor was overbearing. She has become a physicalized aspect of her nature in a comic revenge moment. Gradually, though, she becomes more bear than queen as she discovers an appetite and begins to reject the trappings of civilization that have been so important to her. As the story moves towards its denouement and Merida races against time, her father and her father's axe, the other men and an ancient curse to save her mother, we see too that she is racing against her mother's true bearishness as well. In the penultimate moment of the drama, Eleanor is no longer Eleanor. As a bear, she rises to her full height, raising a powerful paw with sharp claws, preparing to destroy her children and her family. She is surely powerful enough to do it. The moment shows Merida that maternal love can be compromised. It shows Eleanor's true fierceness at its most dangerous when we have already understood comically that turning into a bear when you are overbearing is a natural segue. If we have accepted that, then perhaps we must also accept that her murderous fierceness, her anger, and her appetite are also natural, though she has hidden them well, as we all do, as we all must. This is where the movie is the most brave. The desire for abiding maternal love is natural and powerful. As children, we want it. As adults, we hope we can live up to it for our children. But it is liberating to share the stories of our bearishness, of our overbearingness. It is useful to recognize that we have the capacity to hurt our children simply because we are powerful. Certainly, when our own needs are not being met, or we are not meeting them because we are confined in cultural paradigms that starve us, or stories of our own making that suggest we repress full selves, we run the risk of exploding into full bearishness. To have a mother in the story is to reinvent the plot. 
to show a mother in a story who is both loving and a bear and dangerous in both aspects is brave. And it's about time. Of course, Merida saves her mother in the end, and in doing so, saves herself, not just from her mother's bearish teeth and claws, but from an incomplete understanding of herself. In the final image of the movie, we see mother and daughter outside the castle walls, riding together, which suggests that the parameters of both their lives have opened up, that both have outgrown the castle walls and the paradigms that entrapped them. I give Merida a much better chance at a successful marriage, when she is ready, than I do to any other Disney princess. Her brothers are cuter as bears, but that's another story. Thank you.